Yo, and welcome back to the Corona Bunker. And uh, today we're going to be talking about the mental illness and the left. Uh, of course, uh, that's uh, a preprint I put out some time ago, and it's now been formally published in the Mankind Quarterly. Where else? And we're going to be talking about it. So um, apparently, I have to hide here. Oops. So back in February twelfth. Uh, 2020, uh, Philippe Lemoyne, some French philosophy student or something like that, um, he published uh, results of his analysis of the Sledgedar Codex survey showing that um, if you look at self-reported mental illness, and he looked specifically at depression, borderline, uh, bipolar and schizophrenia, and I think also he included anxiety disorder, um, if you just uh, count these rates by self-rated political labels, whether you use the alt-right or uh, liberal or far-left, communist, conservative, classical liberal, this sort of thing. If you look at the kind of far-left labels, uh, as I've made the, the plot larger here, so we look, if you look in the far-left, we see that the rate is much higher than, uh, than overall or in the middle, and uh, the far-right doesn't have the same, doesn't have the same issue um, so the horseshoe theory seems to uh, fail in this case. Um, so of course, uh, when he tweeted this, it got a massive interest and uh, I was of course intrigued uh, because of the whole uh, interesting people on Twitter observation that I've been making for a long time. And uh, so the problem with his survey is that um, it's based on 8,000 people, good sample size, self-reported mental problems, okay hard to get objective like or the other report or like court records or something um but it's all from a survey of people who are taking as who are readers of a specific blog so it's possible that this blog has some content that attracts you know more mentally ill left-wing people than uh mental ill right-wing people for, for whatever reason um so it's worth looking at this in a larger data set and um here we see some interest that was to uh, Lemoyne's um, tweet here. We got even Infowars uh, reposted it, and the tweet itself got a decent number of retweets and likes and so on. And there was also some forums and so on. Um, anyway, so, but the problem is, as I said before, it's a self uh, self selected survey sample, and uh, so what you really want is is more of a representative sample of adults of some country. So. Uh, it turns out that if you read the replies to this tweet that uh, Inductivist, some alt-right blogger or so, he, he, he links to a post that he did in 2007 uh, where he looked at the, uh, the GSS, the General Social Survey that we will talk about in a minute, and he came up with these results. And there is one question uh, whether someone reports having an, a, a, a history of mental illness, and he found this breakdown of... 30% among the extremely liberal and about five among the extreme conservatives. Um, so something like that. Um, it turns out that this is actually the most extreme result you'll get uh, of the samples in that, but maybe he didn't know that. Um, anyway, so it brings us to this. So this is uh, the new paper. Um, you can read the abstract and pause the video if you like. Um, it's in the issue of Mankind Quarterly that's coming out right now. So it's right now in the upcoming uh, early release edition, but it's really kick-ass and it, of course it's 100% white male this time. Um, the general social survey is uh, also just normally held the GSS. It's a long running and recurrent survey of US adults. They assemble people every second year. So every round year, 72, 74 and so on. They don't normally do longitudinal follow-ups, but sometimes they do follow-ups from one wave to another. So sometimes you'll get people who were asked in 72 were also maybe asked in 74, but then not in 76. Those are only, so only two-year follow-ups and only some sub-samples. Uh, it's still ongoing and they, they keep me uh, asking many questions uh, for many years and uh, also swap them out once. So it's like partially consistent over time. Um, it's widely used to study historical trends. Um, since it has a lot of questions about political beliefs and preferences and sexuality and all kinds of stuff. It even has IQ, it has the famous uh, 10 item word sum test, which is not super good, but it's decent. Um, unsurprisingly, if you look at Google Scholar, you'll see that there's about a million studies, and a million means 74,000 here, uh, studies that's mentioned or used this study or this data set. 
Um, so the good thing about uh, the GSS is it's it's completely public data set. Uh, you simply go to the website and download. There's no bullshit, no red tape, no no fees and no applications, no ethics board reviews, no uh, you know hidden political censorship. Um, and the website also has a, uh, a nice search uh, engine or so. You you just go there and you type whatever keyword you want. You want mental health. It shows you all the variables which years these variables were asked and whether it was given to the full sample or only partial. So the, uh, I don't know what you call it in English, but the half colored means um, only part of the sample was given this question and this one means full and these years not at all. Uh, so it's it's just science as science should really be done. We should be funding a lot more just public data sets so that our interests uh, give out fines to data or researchers who hide publicly sponsored data, that sort of thing. Um, there's, no, there's nothing prevents the, this optimization. Um, in this case, I looked for the, of course, uh, mental health variables, and I found five of them. And uh, you need a certain sample size. There are some more with much lower sample sizes, and, but I, I only used the ones with a thousand plus. And it's because uh, for these binary questions, what you it's very difficult to estimate the rate if it's very low uh, of this sort of uh, so you, especially if you're only interested in say, uh, or mainly interested in the extremes of political view, say the far left or the far right and this sort of thing. Um, so th there's four binary uh, questions. This is the entire text. And then there's one numeric one, which is this one. So this one is the most important one because uh, it's numeric. So you get more uh, statistical precision for the same amount of people. It has the largest sample size. And that's because it's been asked since 2002. And they keep asking it. So every year we get another uh, label or another wave of data here. These other ones you can see they're only given in a few random years. Uh, this one we're given twice, but 13 years apart apparently. Uh, these ones are only one year. Okay, so and to return to the sample issue, so you see, here you see the, uh, the the distribution of political ideology in the GSS, and this this is just assessed from a single item that says. Uh, self-rate you into one of these seven groups. Uh, and, and we can see that um, most people are actually moderates uh, or kind of centrist moderate type. And they are approximately 40% or 35 now, uh, 37 or so percent of the population. And uh, most politics is actually driven by, by these more extreme people down here who are uh, who live and breathe politics. And they're like so into politics and they spend so much time on it and so on. And we can see that in, in, uh, in line with the kind of the rising political uh, controversy or extremism, we see that from, uh, from 1975 to now, this, this, the far left and the far right have doubled in, in size. So they were only 5% down here, but now they're about 10%, five each. Um, so when they keep talking about the rise of the far right, they're, they could just as well easily be talking about the rise of the far left. Uh, as far as our surveys are, uh, are uh, concerned, that's the word. Um, so this is the basic pattern of results. This is a, a, a binary outcome. So it's asking people uh, which fraction of people have ever personally received treatment for a mental health problem. And this is just the first of these four binary ones. And so we see that the error bars are quite wide. And that's because um, remember that only 5% of the sample or maybe 2% of the 2.5% of the sample are in these these uh, most extreme groups. So it's very difficult to estimate the proportion correctly, right? And I've also broken it down by sex because uh, many people be, re, will be interested in um, some kind of sex, um, sex confounding, right? And we do see that these values over here are, are far higher than the ones over here. So this one um, will be about 33% or so, and this is about uh, 20%. So the average will be around here, right? Uh, it's probably not equal men of women in these categories, but you know, roughly you get the pat you get the picture, right? Um, the most important variable is the um, the one with the days of mental health. Uh, so this is asking people to think back the last 30 days. How many days did you have poor mental health? Like you were feeling depressed this day, or this sort of thing. So people give a, a numerical answer, like zero, two, five, you know. How many bad days did you have last month, right? Um, because every person gives a numerical estimate, the, these data provide a lot more statistical precision or power for the same sample size, but also the samples are much larger. Um, so in this best variable, we see a quite clear trends uh, in that this group over here is 
is definitely larger than, than average and it's uh, also a lot larger than over here. Um, these groups in the middle, they're kind of very similar. Um, it seems to be mostly the extreme left that kind of stands out. Um, so the problem is, of course, that uh, these results could be due to uh, age and sex confounding. And uh, confounding means that um, there is a different variable that causes that causes both things. Uh, so maybe maybe it's not uh, you know being extremely liberal that's really associated or causes mental illness or maybe caused by mental illness. Uh, it's really that uh, far left people tend to be young and young people have more mental illness or something like that. Um, it can also be women if there's more women uh, in the left uh, and women have, have on average uh, more mental problems. Uh, as we see though, uh, I did a regression model to control for age and sex and uh, the association doesn't go away. So this is the, uh, the same variable as just before, the, uh, the mean days of uh, bad mental health. And uh, we see the roughly the same pattern as before. Uh, this, the, the standard errors, the error bars will be a bit larger because we used some statistical precision by uh, computing these. Um, I also looked at this for whites only and you get the same pattern. Um, there's probably not enough data to look at subgroups, but, but maybe. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to that because uh, apparently it may be so. Um, one question, of course, is that are these differences really large enough that we care about them? It may be that statistically, if you have 11,000 people for this one variable, you can find some small difference, but if it's, uh, if it's too small, then no one cares in real life. And so the question is, is it large enough that we care? And uh, here I plotted the Cohen's D gaps for the uh, continuous variable. So it's still the variable about uh, days of mental health issues. And we see that if we look at the extreme liberals as a comparison group, and we look at all the other ones, this is how much the other ones are doing better uh, in terms of Cohen's D, right? So we see that of the most extreme uh, political activists, the far X activist groups, it will be extreme conservatives and extreme liberals, right? And so we see that among these uh, these political activist types, there will be about 0.4 uh, standard deviation difference, um, and that's that's quite a bit. If you think that, think about it, that this is a self-reported one question measuring political ideology and one question measuring how many bad days a month. No one in their right mind thinks that these variables are measured perfectly. And so if we were to adjust for uh, if we were to adjust for measurement error, this difference would be somewhat larger. Uh, in my study, I, I guesstimated it should be about a uh, half standard deviation. Uh, so about 20% larger or 25% larger than what we see here. But uh, further studies will have to look into this to really clarify. Um, and one f uh, thing that some people were objecting to, and uh, Scott Alexander, uh, uh, the guy whose blocks uh, survey sparked the whole Lemoyne tweet and so on, he uh, expressed uh, uh, problems that, for instance, uh, this association could come from uh, self-report bias. And the, the reason here is kind of simple is that uh, maybe since the liberals are or left-wingers are on average kind of more friendly, disposed in a broad sense to, um, to mentally ill people, they're more in line with supporting them and giving them voting rights and you know paying for mental hospitals so, yeah all this uh, socialism healthcare stuff and um, right wingers are, are less so are conservatives and so it could be that um, actually far left and far right and uh, the middle of the road people are equally uh, mentally ill however it's just that stigma among the conservatives or a lack of stigma among the uh, the lefties uh, result in higher rates of, you know, self-reporting this in surveys. Um, so one way to attack this problem is that uh, we can instead look at happiness. Uh, and so there's no particular stigma about this. And if we look at happiness, uh, since it's the reverse in some sense of mental illness, at least mentally ill people tend not to be very happy, at least most of the time. Uh, and uh, so we would expect to find the opposite pattern that uh, conservatives should be happier and um, Indeed, we see this is the case, and um, this actually has been found many times, uh, not just uh, in this study, but also with other variables such as religion. Uh, tons of studies show that religious people are happier and healthier, and healthier covers both uh, mental illness and uh, normal physical health, somatic health. Uh, so this this kind of find this kind of finding of mental illness in the left. It really fits uh, totally fine with other other research, uh, so it's, it would kind of be 
it would kind of be unexpected if you didn't find this pattern. Um, so another thing we can look at is that we can look at the temporal stability. So if we return to uh, to thinking of the chart I showed in the beginning with the the, the data set, you you saw of course that uh, or we saw that many of the questions were asked in uh, waves in many years. And uh, this is also true for this happiness question, which actually has been asked since the very beginning of this uh, survey in every year. Um, so what we can do is that, of course, we can uh, we can aggregate the data within every decade, and then we can see if this pattern holds. And we, the reason we need to kind of aggregate within a decade is that uh, we want some more statistical precision, and we also don't want like an overly cluttered uh, plot. So here we go. I've done it by decades, and what we see is that uh, this days of mental health, it sh shows, you know, similar uh, slope in both the 2000s and 2010s. And so, uh, reversely, the happiness question shows uh, a positive slope in every decade since the 1970s. Uh, these effect sizes, you could maybe say that they are changing over time, but I did look into this a little bit and they, they don't seem to be changing much. Uh, just this one is slightly below uh, it's kind of breaking the trend a little bit. Uh, it may be a coincidence. We'll see. Um, but in any case, these, this pattern definitely goes back to, to at least the 1970s. Uh, and we'll see that it's also true when we look at some other studies. Um, so another way of getting more uh, statistical precision given our data set is that uh, we can combine, combine our variables. And the normal approach to combining variables would be to do kind of a fact analysis. We look at the intercorrelations between the variables and we come up with a way of scoring them all together to give it like a single index of, of mental problems like a, a general psychopathology uh, pathology, uh, factor uh, p factors they call it nowadays not to be confused with the uh, psychoticism of i think and um, so the the problem is that uh, these questions aren't given in the same survey year uh, so they don't have any intercorrelations or uh, other statistical associations since they weren't given to the same people However, uh, what we can do is that we can arbitrarily set uh, moderates as one and then calculate the, the relative risk compared to the moderates. And so this puts all the questions on the same scale. And once they're on the same scale, we can uh, do a weighted average uh, and that's, that's how we get uh, this result. And um, because four of the questions are dichotomous binary outcomes, one of them is continuous. They don't have the same like base rates. Um, it's kind of difficult to to come up with an analytic like equation for how the standard errors are. So what we, instead we're doing is that we simply bootstrap the uh, data and calculate the the, the, um, the confidence intervals in that way. Uh, and for those who are not familiar with bootstrapping, uh, it's a theory light approach where instead of uh, relying upon some math that basically says if uh, theoretically, this equation should hold given this or that assumption, normality, blah, 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 uh, no outliers, and so on. Bootstrap throws that all away and you just resample the data set. And so, resampling means that you take the same data and then you just take a sample of it of the same size with, uh, with duplicates. And so, this means that uh, you get a new sample that's some variation of the existing one, and then you recompute all the measures and then that's that's a new estimate and you do that a thousand times and then you can make these bars so it sounds uh, really stupid but it works very well uh, so it's perfect i love hack solutions um, another way to look at it is we can look at uh, partisanship instead and so uh, one reviewer uh, was um, uh, suggesting that we look at party affiliation and so i hadn't done that i've only been looking at uh, self-rated ideology because that is what uh, Lemoyne was talking about and some of these other people and uh, interesting enough we, we do see that uh, for these binary outcomes the pattern seems to be mostly the same uh, the more uh, the strong Democrats are the highest on average and the uh, the strong Republicans are the lowest uh, but if we look at the days of mental health uh, poor mental health we don't get this pattern at all we in fact see that the independents are highest uh, then the far left and then the far right so the far Right, or the strong Republicans are still uh, still below the far left, but somehow the, uh, the independents are, are are higher here. So it's uh, kind of puzzling, and I don't I don't really know what explains this. And uh, I didn't actually look into it more because it was just a side uh, validation. Um, but aside from this this one uh, non-monotonic pattern in the data, it seems to replicate uh, fine with the 
insofar as comparing the the far x you know groups are concerned um, it can be some kind of confounding for the uh, independence who knows you can look at it if you want um, another way of looking at it um, is to look at voting choices among patients of mental hospitals and some of these are actually uh, locked up and other of them are what I think they are called outpatients so there are people who are clinically registered in a mental hospital and are receiving some form of care but live in independent housing or like supervised housing or something like this and there are a few uh, old studies of this here's three of them uh, we don't really have to look too much um, somehow they're waiting so the basic uh, approach with these studies is that they wait for some kind of election uh, when there's an election, they survey the, uh, the patients of the mental hospital to see how often they're voting and who they're voting for. So they don't normally ask the last question, but sometimes they do, uh, of course, anonymously. And um, the real reason researchers are doing this, these studies is that psychiatrists are um, kind of far left or on average left. And they are concerned that uh, mentally ill people aren't voting enough um, because apparently to them, uh, everybody should be voting 100% of the time. Um, even even if they're literally mentally ill. So, um, uh, in any case, we do see that of these studies, this one of them is from Germany. Um, there's another one from uh, US, and they do they do show that so there's some tilt towards uh, left wing parties. Um, there is also a very old one from the 70s that shows this pattern, and um, that's consistent with our survey data from the GSS showing the happiness pattern goes back at least to the 70s. Um, then there's this funny paper, and uh, that's at least one of the funniest title of a paper in a, a long time. Authoritarianism is good for you. Actually, not exactly what the paper shows. It tries to show that uh, that authoritarianism is kind of uh, related to men being more sturdy mentally. So if you're re you're if you're in some kind of crisis, then uh, some people are more affected by a crisis than other people, and this seems to be as associated with uh, right-wing authoritarianism, uh, so which is some kind of mixed measure of of being kind of tough-minded and also right-wing. Um, so it's kind of, it, the samples is actually quite small and it's got some wonky statistics. So the study is not actually very good evidence of much of anything, but it's kind of funny. Um, so they're basically advocating this uh, meme theory is that we have hard times and hard times create strong men. And strong men then create good times Good times create weak men, and then weak men create hard times. Um, and so, there, of course, the kind of, I think, turning point you say is like some kind of American nationalists, and they, of course, relate this to our current times. And so, um, not my president and, you know, colored hair and these kind of people. Uh, that's, that's here we are, right? And this is where we're going. Uh, so you can, you can interpret this kind of meme both genetically and, and phenotypically, right? Genetically speaking, if you do have hard times, then you know, traits that are good in hard times will, will prosper or, uh, you know, spread in the population and differently in these other ones. Uh, so in this, in the genetic interpretation, uh, the selection pressures would be changing over time uh, in this. Over here, you can think of it more as humans have uh, a certain malleability of, um, of psychiatric health and that it, um, that uh, good times allow people to more easily express their uh, weak health so to say, or be even incentivized to do it. So, you know, if you can get disability points for or diversity points for having more disabilities, then, you know, a certain proportion of people are, are going to be uh, more willing to express uh, poor mental health behavior or, you know, this sort of thing. Um, so, of course, we can we can look at this, uh, this theory. Is there any actual evidence for it? And uh, currently, as many of you know, uh, we're living in a crisis time and uh, I don't refer to the top presidency here. Drumpf. No, I'm of course thinking of the Corona Chan, and the Corona Chan is causing uh, massive worldwide problems and um, seemingly also causing a lot of distress. And um, so, Zach Goldberg has found a linked survey. Um, I believe these are the same people, but uh, maybe maybe it's not. Maybe these are. Yeah, actually, I think maybe these are different people. Uh, in any case, so but he he looked at the same kind of, or not the same, but similar breakdown of mental health. As before, and you can see one of them is asked in late March, and the other one is in late April. And apparently, there should be one in May coming out, right? Uh, but I haven't seen it yet. Um, today is uh, May the 25th. That's why I was looking over there, and so I'm looking at these, and so I'm thinking they should be gathering it right now. But uh, apparently, it's not out yet. 
And so the interesting part about this is that um, the the far left over here, they are having worse uh, mental health in recent times. They're like they're actually getting worse in this time of crisis. Whereas over here, this difference is, is not significant. This one is significant. Uh, but this, as you can see with these air bands, is the sample is kind of a bit too small for doing this kind of thing with uh, real certainty. But it's uh, definitely suggestive of the uh, hard times meme being uh, having some kind of accuracy, uh, which is uh, highly interesting. Um, this same uh, sample, uh, the Pew American Trends Panel 4064, uh, these are actually public as well, these Pew Research, so uh, I love Pew Research. Um, so uh, Sack, he also looked at um, whether this main association is, is uh, white people only, because a lot of people seem to s or have noticed that it seems to be mostly white liberals that are hit with uh, you know, blue hair and trainingism and all these things. Um, and uh, we can see that uh, if you break it down, um, it seems to be the case uh, that at least the slope is a lot larger in in um, in white people, but it may not be entirely gone. You can see the far left here is at 19, and over here it's 14, 13. So there is some slope here, but uh, it may not be uh, significant with this sample size. There's 3,000 non-whites here. Um, I think actually, if you look do the regression here, it'll probably be significant between the groups. Um, so it, it does seem to be the case that uh, the internet memes of far uh, why, you know, far left white liberals are are crazy, right? That that seems to be borne out. Um, so when you go on Twitter next time and you see these kind of people, uh, you shouldn't be too surprised, right? You shouldn't be too surprised. All right, that's everything for this time. And uh, here are the references. And uh, see ya.